Welcome back to the Electromagnetism playlist on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, what we want to do is we want to find the total force, the electric force, on this charge up here, Q2, due to this green ring of uniformly distributed charge density. Okay, so this is my, it's a circle, it's drawn with some perspective, but this is my uniformly charged ring, and it has a charge density a linear charge density of lambda. And remember that if you aren't given lambda explicitly, what you can do is you can take the total charge of the ring, if it's given, and divide by the total length of the ring. Okay, and that will give you the charge density, although, although normally the charge density is given. Okay, and just keep in mind, Q2, the charge, is positioned directly over the center of the circle. Okay. And the distance between any point on the ring and the origin is given by R, and the distance between the origin and Q2 above the ring is Z. Okay? And I've gone ahead and drawn all the triangles here so that I can just go ahead and explain how to do this problem. All right, so we're talking now about a ring here. It's not just a simple point charge like Q2 is. So because we're dealing with a ring or something that's just not a point charge, we're going to have to actually compute an integral. Okay, so what I can do is to simplify this, I can actually look at one small, infinitesimally small fraction of the ring. Okay, I think we would all agree that a ring has some length. Um, in fact, the length of a circle is the circumference, but we're just going to focus on a very, very, very small fraction of that length, and we're going to call it dl. L for length, so a differential length element right here. And this small part, or this small fraction of the ring, has some charge. In fact, its charge is proportional to the charge density, okay, which was given by lambda. But since I'm only looking at a very, very infinitesimally small fraction of the ring's length, whatever charge is at that point between those two purple lines, I can treat that as a point charge. So even though you could sort of view this uh, ring as Q1, I'm only looking at one small fraction of it, and that's going to simplify the problem. So I'm looking at this part of Q1 right here, essentially. Okay, And in this problem, Q1 is going to be represented by the linear charge density lambda times dl. Okay, And the charge density, at least the linear charge density, is usually given in units of something like coulombs per meter, let's say. So charge per unit length. So if you multiply coulombs per meter, times dl, which is in meters, you'll get back to units of coulombs, which are the units of uh, charge, or q1. Okay, And sometimes just keep in mind that lambda can be in units of something like nanocoulombs per meter. Okay, Now, here's a differential expression for the force. And Coulomb's law, remember, basically says that the force is equal to q1, which is my lambda dl. So q1 times q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0, and whenever you see 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, that can also be replaced by k, Coulomb's constant. I've chosen to put that here for now. And then we have to divide or multiply by 1 over the distance between the q1 and q2. Now, this right here is what I'm talking about as q1, right here between the purple lines, and here's q2 up here. So I'm not talking about the z distance, that's not my r. This is the r in the problem, but that's not the distance we're talking about. We're talking about the distance between q2 and q1. So I can use Pythagorean theorem. If this is r and this is z, then the hypotenuse of this effective triangle would have to be the square root of r squared plus z squared. Now remember, Coulomb's law is one of the inverse square laws. So I can't just throw in this radical down here. I have to square it, which is why it doesn't have a power. It's just simply r squared plus z squared because whenever I square the square root, the radical goes away and it's just to the first power. Okay? So this is the total force, just, just the force. Okay? We have a problem though. This force element right here, df, is looking at both the vertical and horizontal components of the force. So if I look at q1 right here, this segment, and q2, q1 would tend to push q2 in this direction where this red arrow is. And this, you can see, has a, a vertical component, and it would also have a horizontal component not shown. Okay, now here's the, here's the question. A lot of times when you're dealing with problems in physics like this, where you have a ring of charge or a disk of charge or something, you can actually exploit symmetry to make the problem a lot simpler. So let me ask you a question. 
So I just showed you, this is the vector, uh, the, the differential force vector of how Q1 would push Q2, assuming we're talking about this region right here. But what if I went directly across the ring over to this side? Well, I would go up here and Q1, at least right here, would tend to push Q2 this direction, okay? And because Q2 is directly centered over the origin of the circle, the center, any horizontal component on one side of the ring is completely canceled by the horizontal component on the other side. And it's not just right here and right here. If you think about, let's say I had a force element right here. Well, the horizontal components would be canceled from the component produced from over on this side. Okay? So for every point on this ring, there's a part on, directly across the ring, across the origin, that will cancel its horizontal component of the force. So all I'm concerned with is the vertical component. And really, any time you have these ring problems, this is something to look out for. You're almost always concerned with only one aspect of the force. Maybe it's the horizontal, maybe it's the vertical. In this case, it's the blue vertical part. Now, how would I determine uh, the expression for only the vertical part? Well, I have a triangle right here. Okay, Here's my Q2. I can also draw a theoretical triangle up here. So here's my actual total force vector. This is the red one. The vertical component is blue. I can draw this imaginary purple line right here to create a similar triangle to this one right here. So this angle theta right here is the same angle right here. And that means if this is the angle theta, and this red one is the hypotenuse of this triangle, then this blue vertical part would be the cosine of this angle theta. So in order to calculate the vertical component of the force, I would need to multiply this force equation by cosine of theta. So that's what I've done here. The differential force element of z, so the vertical component, which we're calling z, is q1, which is lambda dl, times q2, either multiply by k or divide by 4 pi epsilon 0. We still have that 1 over r squared plus z squared, and now I throw on this cosine of theta, which gives me only the vertical component of the force. But I don't want to leave it in terms of theta. I rarely ever want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an expression for the cosine of theta given the sides of the triangle that I already know, because these thetas are the same. So what would my cosine of that angle be? Well, cosine, remember, is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I would need to multiply, or at least replace cosine of theta, by z, the adjacent side, divided by the square root of r squared plus z squared. And that's what I, you see right here. I have essentially just replaced cosine of theta with z divided by the square root of r squared plus z squared. Um, I've just simply put it to the 1 half power, which is the same as a square root. Now what else can I do? Well, I can actually just pull this z over here, replace it with the 1, and I can actually combine these two terms that both have an r squared plus z squared. This one right here is essentially to the first power, so that's the 2 over 2. 1 is equal to 2 over 2. This one's to the 1 over 2, so if I combine these two, that's what you see down here, I now have an r squared plus z squared, but now it's to the 3 halves power because of 2 halves plus 1 half. So now I have df sub z is equal to q1, which is lambda dl, times q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times z divided by r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. And um, this really isn't too important here, but I go ahead and went ahead and switched this because just to expose you to some things. But if you have 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, I can replace that with k coulombs constant, which is approximately 9 times 10 to the 9th newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Okay. And the only other thing I did is I, you know, I pulled the DL out in the back, okay? So here you see a DL now um, at the end. That's usually where I put my differential. All right, the question is, what do I do now? Well, let's think about this situation, which is actually fairly common for um, a charges above a ring of charge. K is obviously a constant. It's the product of three constants, 4 pi and epsilon 0. Lambda is a constant because it's uniform charge density. Q2 is a constant. This charge isn't changing. Z is a constant. R is a constant. We don't have this charge moving up and down. The ring isn't contracting or anything. So everything in front of this DL is a constant. And what happens when I'm integrating a constant over some differential element? Well, I can pull all these constants out in front and just integrate the differential element. 
So therefore, notice we're no longer in differential force. This is the force in the z direction, is k times lambda times q2 times z over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. And I'm going to be integrating dl, and I'm looking at this whole length of the circle, so I'm going to integrate from 0 all the way to l. Okay, that's the entire length. But what is the entire length of a circle? Well, that's its circumference. So, in other words, the integral from 0 to l of dl is literally just 2 pi r. And that's your final answer. Um, the force in the z direction is equal to, and by the way, the force in the z direction is the total force because all the horizontal components cancel. So really the total force is equal to k lambda q2 times z over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power and then times 2 pi r. And if you knew the values of all of these things, you would just plug them in and that would give you the force of the ring of charge on Q2. All right. Hopefully this video gave you some intuition on how to do this kind of calculation. Um, it's not as simple as just applying Coulomb's law because we don't have a point charge here. We have a ring of charge. It's a charge distribution. So usually when we have that, we're forced to do an integral. Okay. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.